Welcome to a special Halloween episode of Off the Menu. I'm Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with famous author and historian Charles Coulomb. No, no key of LARPers, no title? No, just famous author and historian's good enough. All right. And we're here with our buddy Jack. Ah, I'm a silent partner. So what's new? Well, several things. As you know, and as Jack here will point out to our friends, a big holiday, hollow, and I can say this, holiday is coming. Halloween. But I have to remember, remind everyone that before Halloween gets here, which will be Tuesday, of next week in 2017, there's another holiday coming up on Sunday. Really? In the traditional calendar, it is the last Sunday in October, and so it is the Feast of Christ the King. Ah. And in the new calendar, it's the last Sunday of the year in November. I actually celebrate both because I can't really get enough of the Feast of Christ the King. Mm. I love that holiday very much. Uh, and it's very important to remember, no matter what insanity you may be going through, or we may be going through as people, as a country, as a world, Christ is still king, despite the attempts of everybody and his brother and sister to deny it. But that's, by the by, in the immediate, it's Halloween. And so, what do you got for me? Well, before we get started, don't forget everyone to buy Sean Leslie's ghost book. Especially for Halloween. Ghostly Tales for Catholics. Uh, and The End of Democracy. Even scarier. The Ultimate Red Pill Book on Politics. Um, one of our... I was recently talking with uh, one of our friends, Laramie Hirsch. Uh, he's a blogger. He was reading The End of Democracy. And he, uh, you know, he reads and he takes notes and he highlights uh, books that he reads. But it wasn't really working out well for him, this method, with End of Democracy, because he discovered that he was just highlighting the whole book. <laughs> That's how good the book is. He's like, I, I don't know what to do. I'm highlighting well, the whole book. There's nothing wasted. Yeah. You know, there's no wasted verbiage in the book. Uh, Christophe Buffon Chauzal, the author, uh, He's got a point to get across, and he gets it across. Mm -hmm. And he does so with a minimum of extraneous detail. Absolutely. Uh, that's the thing about French, you see. It's a very concise language. It's not like English, where you can get all flowery and descriptive and go on and on and on and say nothing in particular. <laughs> it's difficult to do that in French. Interesting, interesting. Okay, uh, so... Yeah, uh, you don't want to miss out on this book, guys, trust <coughs> me. Um, and our next episode will be on the end of dumb democracy, so keep on sending in those questions. Is that the end of democracy? Democracy? D spelled D-U-M-B-O-C-R-A-C-Y? No, oh, no, not well, the end of democracy. That was understood. All right. All right, uh, all right, let's get started. Our first question is from Joshua Hernandez. Hello, Joshua. He sent in a, a bunch of questions today, so yeah, this is the first of many. Uh, oh boy. How did our medieval ancestors view the connection between the living and the dead, and in what particular ways were these beliefs made manifest? What are some of the pre-modern traditions surrounding All Hallows Eve, the Feast of All Saints, and the All Souls? Well, uh, the idea was, and it wasn't just our ancestors, many people today, including myself, have such uh, views, that the, our ancestors are always very close to us. Uh, the, uh, except, please God, the ones who went to hell. Then we know we can do without. But as for the others, uh, the whole notion of, the, of praying for the holy souls, uh, the souls in purgatory, uh, was a very, very important part of everyday life. Praying for the dead was extremely important. Having masses said for them, uh, in some cases, uh, in some places, setting out food for them on uh, uh, All Souls Day or, or, or uh, even the evening, the evening of All Saints uh, as a mark of love and respect for the people who've lost. Um, that was a very big, very, very big thing. Uh, and today, of course, the Day of the Dead is celebrated like that with the Mexicans and the Hungarians and 
up until the 60s, the uh, French Canadians. Then we took leave of our senses collectively. Okay. Um, so, but what are some of the pre-modern traditions? Well, souling was a big thing. And what that meant was going from door to door, uh, asking for food and or booze in return for praying for the dead of that house. Uh, what's interesting is that the uh, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary took the song in England before the Reformation was sung, the, uh, uh, the soul cake song, and turned it into a Christmas carol, which I always thought was kind of funny. You know, um, um, soul cake, soul cake, soul cake, one for Benny, two for Paul, one or three for him who made us, I forget. Anyway, point is, Peter, Paul, and Mary sang it as a Christmas song, but it was really the souling song. Mm. that people would sing in different parts of England as they did this. Um, but it has only a tangential connection to our trick-or-treat. Soul cakes? Soul cakes. They were given out to people who were souling. You would bake soul cakes, and then on All Hallows' Eve, when people would come around, you'd hand them a soul cake, and they'd say a quick prayer for your uh, dead and move on to the next house. What countries did that? Uh, England, southern France, Germany, it was scattered. What if they weren't Catholic? Uh, in these times I'm speaking of, those people didn't exist. <laughs> Not in Europe. Okay. Uh, okay, in what ways were these customs and attitudes challenged and replaced with the rise of Protestant culture? Although the name Halloween obviously comes from All Hallows' Eve, there seems to be no similar celebrations found in other countries who were once Catholic. Instead, these festivities appear to only exist in the most Protestant of all nations. Why is this? Well, we've got several different things at once. Firstly, the whole culture of praying for the dead went out the window with the Protestants because they taught there was no purgatory. Mm -hmm. So you're only going to heaven or hell and uh, your prayers are not going to help a person after they die. Now that, it's interesting that that should be the case because uh, it's very much against human nature which inevitably wants to pray for the dead, even if it doesn't know why. And so it's interesting that after the Napoleonic Wars when so many German Lutherans were killed, the Lutheran churches in Germany adopted a sort of prayer for the dead day, even though it doesn't make any sense for the sample of Lutheran theology. How'd they justify it? Oh, they didn't. That's one of the great things about being Protestant. You can just do without justifying. Uh, and similarly, it's in the Lutheran churches of Sweden and Finland, they kept All Souls Day and didn't bother explaining. You know, we just do it. And there were other places scattered around Europe where very, very few and very rare exceptions uh, as the Reformation was going on, uh, churches that were chapels that were endowed for the chanting of uh, masses for someone, for a particular person, because that was very typical before the uh, Reformation. Let's say you're a wealthy person. Well, you leave X number of money, of whatever your local money was, to endow a priest with a chapel where he would chant the mass daily for you and your loved ones. Well, those, these were called chantries. Well, at the time of the English, at the time of the Reformation, throughout Northern Europe, most of these were suppressed. But I say most of them. Because here there are a few places, Lutheran or Anglican, uh, for whatever reason, they were overlooked. And so, a minister of that religion kept chanting Lutheran or Anglican prayers for the dead. Hmm. Uh, or versions of the prayers. That, and again, it made no sense at all. Yeah. Uh, uh, for de in terms of their uh, their uh, 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 theology, but they did it. Amongst the Anglicans, after the Anglo-Catholic revival, you had something appear called the Guild of All Souls, which was specifically for revival of prayer for the dead in the Anglican Communion, and it's still going. And to add to that, uh, after World War One. So, well, in this country, after the Civil War, you had the rise of Memorial Day. They're planting flowers on graves and civil prayers for the glorious dead. 
which again, in a Protestant country like the United States were, just didn't make sense. But there's a human need to pray for the dead. A human understanding that somehow we can help them. Uh, or, or at least a human need to feel we, we, we right. can. And then, of course, after World War I and the cult of the unknown soldier, it was Katie Bar the door. You had Remembrance Day ceremonies all over the world, again, for our glorious dead. None of it making any sense in terms of Protestant theology, but very, very important. Now, what was the next part of the question was, uh, why do such customs prevail in Protestant countries now? Right. Well, that's not true. Uh, actually, in Catholic countries, you have a number of uncanny evenings where people tell ghost stories and legends of witches and, and, and haunts and all sorts of things, uh, of which All Souls or All Saints Eve is only one, although not the most popular. You have St. John's Eve in the summer. You have May Eve or Valpurgisnacht in the uh, spring. Candlemas Eve in the winter. Uh, St. Mark's Eve, which is also in the spring. Why spring should be particularly scary, I don't know. St. George's Eve, again in the spring. Uh, so, to answer the question, this kind of thing is much more prevalent in Catholic countries than it is in Protestant ones. Uh, and in Orthodox countries as well. Okay. Um. The Romanians believe that uh, all the vampires of Romania go to fight each other on St. George's Eve. And woe, the foolish mortal who gets caught in combat. Wow. Vampires fighting vampires. Okay. Yeah. You can see why you wouldn't want to be there. You'd be like a little refreshment on the side before round two is over. Here, take a quick sip. Back you go. No? No. No, no right. thanks. All right. All right, uh, next question from Joshua. What are the origins of the particularly American celebration of Halloween? That's a good question, too. And the answer is Irish immigrants. Irish? Irish. Irish. Because they were big celebrators of Halloween. So were the Scots. Um, now, it's important to remember that Halloween is liturgically the vigil of all souls. And in the traditional calendar, it's a day of fast and abstinence. So, the Irish would eat this uh, wonderful glop called colcan, made up of boiled potatoes and cabbage and parsnips and things like that, all boiled together. Uh, it's, it's actually quite good. I make it myself on Halloween. Uh, but, you know, it's those sorts of root vegetables and butter. That's it, pretty much. Okay. And they'd show all that stuff. On, it was a special Halloween dish. Uh, but the idea of uh, tearing things up and uh, building bonfires and all that. That came to us from Ireland and Scotland. Uh, building and bonfires? Yes. That's this, part of our ho American Halloween tradition? It, it, was, it was up until the early 20th century. Do you remember the movie, or maybe you don't, with Judy Garland, Meet Me in St. Louis? I've heard of it, but no. Well, it follows a family in St. Louis in 1904 through the year. And the Halloween section, they're building this big bonfire. And the, all the neighborhood kids out of chairs and, and, and old trash and so on. And this was a big thing, was building bonfires. It was also a night for mischief. Uh, TPing people's places or soaping their windows or leaving things called Tic Tacs, which were these weird things made of stones which just keep making noise on a window until you wanted to break something. Uh, they would do the tricks all over the place. And if anything wasn't nailed down, it was something that could be used. So a man might come out of his uh, house one day and find all his lawn chairs on his roof. You, you know, that kind of thing. It's pretty uncivil. Oh, it's extremely uncivil. And by the turn of the century and uh, into the teens of the, of the 19, uh, 1920s, 19 uh, 1890s, 19-teens, um, a lot of the civic authorities throughout the country believed that it was getting a little out of hand. Uh, how did it get that way in the first place? Like, how was that endorsed? It just organically... Well, it grew because there was the idea that the, uh, the uh, uh, beings from beyond were loose that night, and they were the ones really responsible. Well, of course, you give a kid a, uh, a chance to do something horrific like that, and they'll jump with it. That's true. Um, 
the the uh, the other thing that was big then though were parties and games, and these would be fortune telling. They'd be bobbing for apples. Uh, everything you've heard about. There were very special Halloween games, uh, which the nicer people went to. The rowdier people would go out in the street and do funny stuff. But you didn't actually begin to get trick or treating until the twenties and thirties. Uh, and that was encouraged as an alternative to ripping up the town. Even the thing, trick or treat, the idea is that they're being bought off. Mm -hmm. You give them goodies so they're not going to be doing oh, all these right. things. Haven't you ever wondered when you said trick or treat what it meant? No, not really. I just want candy. Ah, well. Then let me take you back in time. <laughs> trick or treat. Now, that implies they've got a choice. Mm -hmm. They don't have to give you candy, but they'll deal with the consequences, won't they? Interesting. And yet, this was kind of a, uh, an unconscious resurrection of souling, only without the religious aspect. And by the time I came along, it seemed like an integral, age-old part of the holiday. Because I'll tell you what, the early 60s were the golden age of trick-or-treating, as far as I'm concerned. I remember the first time I went out trick-or-treating. It was Halloween 1963. I was three years old. You remember that? I do. I had a Heckle and Jekyll costume. A Heckle and Jekyll? Yeah. Uh, Hyde and Jekyll? No, Heckle and Jekyll. These were two cartoon characters. They were crows or magpies oh. or whatever. They were oh. very popular. Oh, okay. It's before your time. You wouldn't know. Oh. But I went out with my brother, and he went out as a devil. And out we went. And we did that, oh gosh, 63, 64, 65. So three glorious years in Westchester County, New York, the, the capital of real Halloween trick-or-treating. And then we came here to California. Yeah, Hollywood. Hollywood. And you know you could still trick-or-treat when I was a little boy? There was still a lot of families living in Hollywood. Okay. So... We went trick-or-treating in Hollywood, and there were a lot of other people who went trick-or-treating. That was one of the few things that made the transition. But it's still it's too warm. You didn't have all the beautiful colored leaves. It wasn't Westchester County by half, and it still isn't. You can't trick-or-treat in Hollywood now? I wouldn't. Why not? Well, I'm not saying. But they do have a big Hollywood, <laughs> uh, Halloween parade. And you'll find every strange creature from vampire to fairy running around uh, Hollywood Boulevard. Okay. Uh, James Jorgensen asks, uh, The tradition of pumpkin carving with everything from knives to assault rifles is an iconic part of Halloween. It is. From where did this custom appear? Well, oddly enough, from the Irish and Scots. What time? Uh, 19th century, where they emigrated over here in large numbers. You see, back in the old country... They had had jack-o'-lanterns too, but unlike our friend here, those were carved out of turnips. Turnips? Turnips. Big turnips. Uh, and those must have been very, very hard to carve, but carve them they did. They came over here, and they discovered the pumpkin. And I'll tell you what, they were, that was it. Yeah. They were in... Jack o' lantern heaven. <laughs> so, I should say. Ever since then, this dear old Jack, I love it. I yeah. absolutely adore the Jack o' lantern. I really do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I can't see it without thinking of kicking back with my dad on the porch, watching him carve the Jack o' lantern, and occasionally allowing me to do this or that. Mm. Uh, this, the, the, the carving of the Jack o' lantern in my house was on a par with putting up the Christmas tree with the making the turkey for Thanksgiving, uh, wow. with the, the fireworks for the 4th of July. It was that big of a deal. Interesting. Yeah. So. Okay. My dad used to say that there were only two days in the year in this family that we could really be ourselves. Halloween and April Fool's. Right. Yeah, that's well. All right. What else we got? Okay. Uh, Joshua Hernandez with another question. He's got a lot. He's got a lot. He sent us a lot of good ones. Um, what sort of evidence did Father Montague Summers present for the existence of vampires and werewolves in his book on those topics? And what exactly does traditional folklore have to say regarding such phenomenon? 
Uh, well, I mean, the evidence he presented was all written accounts by people who, uh, whose uh, veracity one would have no reason to doubt uh, if it were on other topics. You know, if, uh, uh, I don't know, who's, who's the most trusted historian today? Uh, Arthur Schlesinger? Well, all right, fine. <laughs> if Arthur Schlesinger uh, wrote an account of a, uh, of a vampire outbreak in his town in New Jersey, you would take it with some... You might have a hard time believing it because it's about vampires, but because it's written by Arthur Schlesinger, uh, it would count more than if it were in the Enquirer. Mm. So, those are the sorts of sources he used. Uh, he obviously did not produce any photographic evidence. Uh, as far as what was the... the, the uh, what exactly does traditional folklore have to say regarding such phenomena? Well, uh, that werewolves are, uh, and other folklores have other were beings, foxes and jaguars and bears and so forth. But these are creatures who either pre people who either through a curse cast upon them or a spell devised by them change into an animal, uh, in this case a wolf, and that they act as wolves and eat and kill animals and people while they're under the spell. Uh, it was seen traditionally as being a satanic mockery of God, of the Incarnation specifically, because that is uh, God and a man, whereas this is man and animal. And similarly for the vampire, who is really uh, a possessed corpse, that is to say, a resurrected body whose animating spirit was not the person, but a demon. Mm -hmm. So it's a possessed corpse, basically. Kept itself alive with blood, had some possession of its host's memories, and had insult to injury. Uh, it was also an insult to God, this time not the incarnation, but the resurrection, where our Lord was life into death, the vampire's death into life. Wow. So, there you go. Let's say I was a modern scholar, and I was to say to you that the fact that there are no modern accounts of vampires or were werewolves is proof that it, these things are just myths and superstitions. What would you say to me? No, I'd say first I would question whether or not there aren't any modern accounts. That would be my first question. The second uh, would be that the devil tailors his doings to the people he's dealing with. And in the society we live in, it's far more to his benefit to get people to believe he doesn't exist than to convince them of, it, of his existence with this kind of stuff. So you've got to remember, none of these things... Uh, whether we're talking about these sorts of preternatural phenomena or Eucharistic miracles or uh, divine healings through relics or whatever, none of these things happen by accident or at random. Mm -hmm. Good or bad, there is an intelligence behind them, a strategy. We don't know what that strategy is. We, we can't tell. But you ask yourself, why does things happen more in one place than another? Well, we don't know, but there's a reason for it. Of the five Eucharistic miracles that have been uh, proved in the or approved by the Church in the past five years, two were in Poland, one Mexico, one India, and one Argentina. Why those countries, and why two in Poland? Why not one here in the United States? Because well, the faith is, is supposed to come out of Poland, right? Isn't that the prophecy? The faith will come out of Poland. That's one theory, but who knows? I know. If I didn't know, I'd know the mind of God, and I assure you, I do not know that. What else we got? Well, before we jump into oh, other things, oh, 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 two oh. books we've never promoted before. Oh. Speaking of vampires, this book isn't that big of a deal. It's just the reason why Tumblr House exists. This book. Yeah, the Endless Dot, a 12 Hanky book. By Professor Beersack. Uh, if, you, if you've seen, uh, that's the, uh, the gentleman who talks, uh, who's done talks with Charles. If yep. you've listened to any of those talks, these books are written by him. And this is the first book by Tumblr House. Um, and our, our name is derived from the Knight's Tumblr in these books, in this, in this series. Yep. Um, and I believe one of the characters in the Knight's Tumblr is allegedly you. Allegedly. So I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen. 
if you buy at least two of the books, and uh, you you read them and you figure out who the character is that's supposed to be based on me, you will get a shout out by name. Um, Some people here. might are okay, okay. Well, if you already know, don't give it away. This yeah. is for this is for newbies. But I must say, this is of the of the series. This is actually the vampire book, The yes. Darkness Did Not. And he has a phrase in here. Remember, I said to you earlier that the vampire was a uh, possessed corpse. And I don't think I'm giving much away to say that in this particular case, they forced the vampire to tell where it got the body. Right. And the body was that of a 16th century Huguenot in France, who, because he was a good Calvinist and sure that he was one of the elect, for various reasons, killed himself. Now, one of the ways in the old folklore that you got vampires was through suicides. The suicide was very likely to come back as a vampire. Wow. So, remember the, the, uh, remember that the uh, Huguenot in question thought he was going straight to heaven. Well, he kills himself. And this, as I say, they forced the vampire to reveal his origins and the body's origins. He tells him in response to what you just heard, and I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, in keeping with Halloween, this is probably one of the most frightening lines I've ever heard. Oh, yeah, they quote the vampire in the beginning. Yeah, right. read it, if you would. I, uh, and, the thing, and the thing is, uh, the, the uh, suicide was through poison. That was how he killed himself. This is the demon speaking, the vampire speaking. You should have seen the look on his face when he woke up in hell beside me, the demon who was waiting to take possession of his body. What a horrible taste I had in his mouth when I first opened these eyes. That's, I just got goosebumps. That is terrifying. Isn't it? Uh, great book. I've read those books like three times over. Yeah, if you read them a fourth, you get a special present. <laughs> uh, okay, next question is from David Thrower. I was watching what you said about werewolves and had another question related to it. Okay. In Genesis 6, there is an account of strange creatures called the Nephilim. And although I believe there is a connection between that and these legends of lycanthropy and vampirism, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a good question. They definitely, the definitely uh, the mighty men of old uh, are claimed to be the descendants of when the uh, sons of God took wives from the daughters of men. Now this is an obscure passage that people have puzzled over for years and years and years and years and years. Uh, I tend to go for the explanation offered by Lodovico Sinistrari, is a name for you, mm -hmm. in his... Uh, it is a book, Demoniality, which is available in English. He theorizes that the sons of God in question are not angels who are incapable of that kind of thing, but rather the sort of creature that we call fairies or elves, which, respond, which, which covers a lot wider territory than just Tinkerbell. Uh... Amongst it are the, uh, the incubi and succubi, who were uh, seen as beings uh, like fairies of a sort, who would uh, have uh, sex with uh, men and women. The succubi with men as women. I mean, the, the succubi were women. Right. Uh, looking, you know, anyway. And the incubi were men looking. Yeah. Um, one of the theories was that actually it was the same kind of being changing shape. Then it would take, should we say, the genetic material from the man that he acquired as a succubus and then pass it on. Supposedly Merlin was born of such a union. Just say it alone. But uh, whatever the truth of the matter, who knows? I know. It's interesting to speculate, but that's about all you can do. So sons of God aren't merely just normal men? As no. They would not be. No. Because the sons of God with the daughters of men. Oh, that's true. There's a distinction there. There's a distinction there. Uh, so, okay. what were they really? 
Of course, you know, that our, our ancient UFO friends would say that they were aliens. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not something the church has ever defined, so you can speculate as you wish. Okay. I had been waiting to ask this, the following question for like six months. Oh, boy. Her Duell asks, Can you please tell a ghost story in your best Strom Thurmond voice? Strom Thurmond, I guess, being an old-time senator from the South. <laughs> you, you. Well, it is Halloween. Well, back when I was a boy in Farquhar County, it was a long time ago, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, there was an old widow woman lived by herself at the edge of the swamp in a cabin, kind of a tumble down old place. And people would go to see her for medicines mostly. Uh, got a horse down kid down with a croup, maybe, and you didn't have the money to go to no doctor. Now you go to the old widow woman. She'd give her some the herbs and the roots. Well, everybody knew that, but there was also whispers that the widow woman would make other things for a lot of money. Let's say you were interested in having a woman fall in love with you. And there seemed to be no other way to get her to pay attention. You might go to the widow woman. Or let's say you had a rival. Maybe it was in business. Maybe it was in love. Maybe it was uh, some woman's husband that would be better out of the way. Or vice versa. Or maybe a parent that was taking a little too long to leave the inheritance, you know. Well, you go to the widow. Um, she'd come up with something. And it was whispered, none of us knew, of course, it was whispered that if the winner helped you in some of these darker matters, you would get exactly what you wanted and exactly what you paid for. But you know, that old middle woman must have cast the wrong spell on the wrong man someday because nobody heard from her Usually you'd see her on Sunday. She'd never go to church. But you'd see her on Sunday selling baskets and bags of herbs and things like that. The widow woman didn't come to town that day. And a couple of days went by. And finally, one of the Hampson twins, I forget which one it was. It was Sam or Todd. I don't, I, I don't remember. It was one of them. Anyway, one of the Hampson twins went out there, and he saw flies buzzing all around the cabin. And he goes in there, and there she was with a pair of shears stuck in her neck, and she bled out right there. Well, the sheriff came, took away a lot of evidence, and some say there was some incriminating evidence that would have, you know, in the wrong hands would have done some pretty bad things to some of the top people on the counter. Anyway, the sheriff took away a lot of evidence. The coroner took her away. There was nobody to bury the body, so she went into Potter's Field. Uh, nobody could afford to pay for a funeral. Of course, she didn't belong to no church in a house, so that was that. But that old cabin stood out there. And all us boys said it was haunted. We would never go near that cabin. But it so happened. That one day, there was this kid from out of town who was a some relative of one of my friends. I forget how, so I'm sure they're relative. He was from California. And up Sacramento, California, somewhere like that. And that boy, he had heard the rumors. And he told us, he said, you know, that's all superstition. Where I come from in California, we know that's nonsense. I will go out to this cabin, and I will show you that there's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I mean, people had heard things from that cabin. They had heard yelling and screaming, and there's nobody out there. So we knew it was haunted. Sometimes you'd see lights out there where no lights should be. 
Well, the bunch of us were out with him, out there on the edge of the swamp. And that boy, I got to tell you, he was brave. Not smart, but brave. He went out, and we saw him go in. The light was out. It was as lit as a little widow woman over there. Well, suddenly he goes in the door, we see the door closed, the light goes out. And we hear this ear-splitting shriek of horror. And then the door opened. And the boar came out. And had a blank look on his face. And every hair on the top of his head had fallen out. And he comes up. And he looks at us, and we said, what the, what happened? Wouldn't tell us. Couldn't say a word about it. And he was only kind of halfway ever after. And then eventually his relatives took him back to California. And you know, until you folk elected him your governor, I did, never did hear from him again. <laughs> wow. How's that? That was really good. Was that a scary story? That was a scary story, all right. Very good. <laughs> Very nice. Why did, why did the Californians elect him governor? Well, he probably operated on our level. Ah, that would make sense. Because <laughs> my dad would say, don't ever vote for anyone smarter than himself. <laughs> right. All right, what else we got? Uh, okay. Was that southern enough for him? That was southern enough, yeah. Southern fried? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question is by Maspooks. Are ghosts different from demons? If so, what makes them different? Whew. Well, the answer is yes and no, no, and yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Well, if you were to read and say, oh, I don't know, Sir Sean Leslie's ghost book, yeah. you would see that the church teaches that ghosts come in three varieties. That, well, two varieties first. Those that are simply like films going on and on and on. You know, uh, Lady Claire always walks through the blue room at 9 p.m. and... You see this thing walk through, you can throw rocks at it and all that. Mm. pays no attention. It's like a uh, television image being played over and over. But then there are hauntings where there appears to be an intelligence present. And that, so the church teaches us, that will come in one of three varieties. Souls from purgatory, who have come back, either as part of their penance in purgatory, to right or wrong, to ask for prayers, whatever. Second are damned souls. Uh, the third are demons masquerading as the dead, pretending to be the dead in order to fool you. And mind you, damned souls and demons do not have any love for you. If your aunt uh, Azalea is in hell, trust me, she's not the woman you remember. Now, the demon, like an angel, they're the same species, the same race, if you will. They're angels. He's fallen. The people we call angels are not. But they are not human. They've never been human, never will be human. They've never been in the body, at least not this kind of body. Uh, whereas ghosts are the enemy, are the living souls of once living people. Uh, contrary to some popular belief, people who go to heaven do not become angels. Because an angel is a different order of creation entirely. Yeah. So just as the damned do not go to hell and become demons, the blessed do not go to heaven and become angels. We will always be a human being, for all good it does it. What else you got? Okay, uh, your buddy John Ryan in Putnam, Connecticut. Hey, Adam. John! He says, I understand that the church does not allow consultation with mediums, ghosts, and the like. Correct. Could there be any exceptions to this? No. Um, here, see, here's the problem. Uh, if a Catholic sees a ghost... You know, that's one thing. But we are forbidden to summon them. So we can't use Ouija boards, we can't use mediums, uh, go to seances and things like that. Any place where the spirits of the dead are conjured. Uh, partly because you don't know what you're getting. It's very likely to be a demon. you got to remember that when you do that kind of thing, when you do a, a Ouija board or, or a seance or whatever, it's like living in a bad neighborhood and throwing open your door and saying, Hey everybody, come on in! Yeah. Yeah, uh, indeed. Uh, you'll get some pretty rough characters if you, if you do that. So we're forbidden to. Now, that having been said, under certain conditions, and again, I refer you to Sir Sean Leslie's ghost book, 
uh, Catholics are permitted to investigate this kind of phenomena, but not to summon it. You see? There's a big difference. We can investigate it, but we can't summon it. Now, there are no exceptions to that rule. Okay. Uh, next question is from Hector of Troy. Oh, boy. My best to Priam. And, uh, and your sister Helen. I'm sure she's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. He says, I have oftentimes heard of the monster called the Jersey Demon. Ooh. What is the story of this creature, and from whence is it? What can one do if one should meet such a thing? Well, the Jersey Devil is another name for Governor Chris Christie. No, no. That... Can we not get political? Can we not go there? I agree. Thank you. Honestly, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, if we can move past that. Um, the Jersey Devil is a... Uh, a story that comes to us in the late 18th, early 19th centuries originally. Uh, and there are a lot of explanations for it. The Jersey Demon, Jersey Devil, uh, supposedly was a deformed child. And again, there are various uh, stories given, various explanations as to how he came to be, who he was, who his father was. But his mother was a human being. Uh, she gave birth to him. And at first he was semi-normal, but then his bizarre traits came out. And I think his stepfather was nasty to him or something, and he ended up flying off because he could fly. That was one of his traits. And he spent the rest of his time bedeviling the state of New Jersey, which Lord knows has had its share of problems and probably didn't need another. Uh, the blacks in northern Jersey called him the Snellygaster, the Snellygaster, which is, because they still spoke Dutch then, uh some sort of a, a version of Schnellgeist, or fast ghost. Uh, people vary as to whether he's a beast, a man, or a ghost. Now what should you do if you run into him? Uh, make the sign of the cross and hope he goes away. Gosh, well, you know, it's it's interesting that it's it's a he and that it's a person because um, there's a pretty sizable Wikipedia article on the Jersey Devil for all you interested in. This thing is looks like a beast. It's got the head of a goat, body of a kangaroo, yep. uh, cloven hooves like a horse, and then wings like a bat. Mm -hmm. and, That's one version. Uh, yeah, well... See, there are many versions of the Jersey Devil. Interesting. And which of them, if any of them, are true, who knows? I don't. As I say, it's Governor Crit No! Leave politics out of this. Isn't it interesting that the New Jersey hockey team, or the Devils... It's named after them. Named after... Name the after Devil. Yeah. Isn't that it interesting? It is. And there are a lot of stories, especially if we go into the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. That's in the southern part of the state. Oh. They have a lot of uh, stories about him. Uh, of course, the Pineys have a lot of stories about everything. <laughs> Those are the people who live in the Pine Barrens, the Pineys. Okay. You know, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things Californians really realize is that in the East, there are these little restricted areas where people are kind of inbred is such an unkind term. But suffice to say, somewhat remote areas where people retain stories and customs that the rest of us have lost. Sometimes for good reason. But at any rate, these are fascinating places, and I recommend the Pine Barrens. Although, be careful, they've had poison ivy there, you know, as thick as a man's arm. Can you imagine a big poison ivy stalk? Yeah, not, that would not be fun. No. Okay, Jay writes in, asking, what are your favorite Halloween movies? Oof, oof, oof. Uh, I would say probably Something Wicked This Way Comes, Sleepy Hollow, uh, Curse of the Cat People. Um, although that doubles as a Christmas film, strangely enough. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, let me see. Dracula, the 1932 version. Um... Really, any of the uh, of the universal classic horror movies, mm -hmm. uh, because see, for me, I want a I want a film on Halloween that 
he gives me a, a couple of, of thrills, a couple of chills, but doesn't scare the wits out of me. Uh, that's sort of familial. What do you think about, I remember when I was young, Nightmare Before Christmas was a big one. Well, that's a fun show, but it, it, it didn't scare me. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a fun idea. Yeah. I know, um, I would love it if the holidays all had their separate towns. I'd, be, I'd get a, 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 what is it, a, a season ticket on a commuter train. <laughs> okay, uh, well, we have a special final two questions for you, sent in by a special uh, entity, I guess you could say. An entity? Yeah. Well, it's Halloween, let's have it. Yeah, he says... Hello, Charles. It is I, Barnabas Coulomb, your ancient vampiric ancestor. Ah, okay. By a strange spell, I was brought back from the grave and now live amongst you moderns. Being, yeah. being lonely, I decided to seek out some of my own. But t much to my horror, vampire kind, as I know it, is a thing of the past. Ah. Most of the vampires I met were just kids playing at being goth, whatever that means. Others didn't drink blood, only energy. What? Hate it when that happens. And in popular entertainment, it's even worse. We are the sex addicts of the night, and our sexuality is portrayed as ambiguous, to say the least. Oh, and other times, we sparkle. Yes, you read that right. And in the Far East, we are shown to wear crosses and live in churches of all places. Charles. My great 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 half nephew thrice removed. What has happened to my people? Why this dramatic change in the perception of vampires and other creatures of horror? Well, <laughs> firstly, Uncle Barnaba, it's good to hear from you again. My personal confession, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the first time my multiple great uncle and I have seen each other. Uh, he'll remember, although I barely do, but back in 67, when I was a little boy, I was at our annual gathering at Bois de Coulomb, the palatial Coulomb estate over the St. Lawrence in Quebec. Uh, there was a knock on the door, a big family reunion, and in comes this gentleman who was the spitting image of a Bonnebar Coulomb who supposedly, about the time of the American Revolution, had gone back to France. He looked exactly like him and announced that he was, in fact, Barnaba Coulomb, and the direct descendant of said cousin. Well, I got to tell you, he wasn't fooling anybody, especially not amongst Coulombs. Believe me, we know our creatures of the night. The kids all knew straight away, and the adults pretended. Uh, but I haven't seen him since, which I'm grateful. Uh, but the annoying thing was that ABC Television, one of our cousins by marriage, worked for them, stole the whole idea and turned it into, if you can believe this, a soap opera, Dark Shadows. Now you know where the inspiration came from. <sighs> you see, there's absolutely no honor among thieves. The parents all pretended they didn't want to insult the vampire? Be well, no, of course not. He was a relative. <laughs> you know, with us, blood comes first. Ooh. In my family. At any rate, uh, no, they didn't want to feel, unco feel uncomfortable. Okay. So they all pretended they, oh, oh yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, I did notice I got a double dose of garlic in my soup that night, though. Anyway, uh, well, to answer your question as to why the change, because society's uh, grasp of evil has gone down the drain. Uh, I mean, let's take a step backwards. Originally, vampires, except, of course, for Barnabas, who was sui generis, being a Kulam, uh, the... You know, anything we go into, we're different from all the rest. It's a family thing. Mm -hmm. You'd have to be related to understand. Yeah. Anyway, the, um, I mean, I had a cousin who was a firebug. He, never, he was afraid of fire. Okay. Have you any idea how difficult it was for him to be a pyromaniac? Closest he ever got was setting a campfire once. Okay. Anyway, so you're looking very confused. Yes. Oh. I'm, f I'm hanging in there. All right. Happy Halloween, by the way. As I was saying. <laughs> See, if you can't play tricks outside, we'll play mind tricks. All right. Uh, no, the thing is that uh, the vampire was seen, as I say, as a possessed corpse. Full stop. End of story. Uh, Bram Stoker, 
and this had begun before him. It was a friend of uh, Murray Shelley and uh, Lord Byron called Dr. Polidori, who wrote a uh, short story called The Vampire, in which he introduced the idea of the grave nobleman, for part of the expression, grave. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, but that, his Lord Ruffin was still pretty foul. Uh, Dracula, as Bram Stoker uh, made him, was repelled by the crucifix, was repelled by the host, uh, was evil, but there was still a certain broken nobility to him. And at the very end, when he gets staked, he's grateful to have been released. Mm. This is, uh, so that implies that his the personality was what was there. Yeah. Well, as time has gone, we gone forward, um, as belief as Christianity has waned amongst those who generate popular, uh, popular culture, uh, the vampire has gone from being uh, evil and repelled by things that are good to being misunderstood, unloved, and definitely not chased away by things that are like crucifixes and so on. Um, which, you know, it, it reflects really the decline in uh, the decline in society as a whole. And the same with the sexualizing of the vampire myth. Uh, everything has gotten sexualized. Yeah. Even the Boy Scouts. So, you know, you're, 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 the vampire, I'm afraid, has shared the fate of everything else in this very sick and stupid culture. And what was the second question? Uh, well, what... Why this dramatic change in perception of vampires and other creatures of horror? Same, same. I mean, uh, the whole, you can't have, you can't understand evil unless you understand good. You see, because evil is an absence of good. Yeah. So. We've lost that understanding. Exactly. And so it's all, it's all different. They're all misunderstood, etc., etc. That's why, I mean, that's why we've had to read it in fairy tales. Uh, probably the most obnoxious that I've come across, I'm sure there are others that are worse, of this rewriting of fairy tales was Walt Disney's Maleficent. Oh, with Angelina Jolie? Yeah. Okay. It was, it was very I obnoxious. It. Well, I did. I was on an airplane. Was that, was that a take on Sleeping Beauty? Yes, was... it was. But uh, poor, uh, poor dear evil fairy is misunderstood. She was done wrong by a man, of course. And in the end, it's not the prince's kiss, but only that of another woman that could rouse Sleeping Beauty. There's way too many misunderstood villains in modern culture. Yeah, you know, they're evil. Got it? Evil. What they need is not understanding, but a stake through the heart or a silver bullet. Yes, even you, Cousin Bonaba. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, that is what they need. If there's any understanding or forgiveness for them, it's on the other side of the grave, not here. Barnabas had a second question for you. He, said, he asked you, uh, do you have a favorite type of monster? And if so, why? <sighs> favorite monster. Favorite monster, an elected official. No, no, will you, can you not do this? <laughs> can you not? Can we leave politics alone for just... I, th I thought elected officials were the snakes that swam across the Atlantic when St. They, Patrick drove them out of Ireland. They sure they, were. They grew up to become elected officials. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's how we got the name of the United Snakes. But the... Uh, no, seriously. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, actually... Uh, you know, I, I would have to say that I've always had a... Uh, if I had to go with monsters, vampires and werewolves... Um, I don't really like. I mean, if, if I had to choose between the two, I'd go with the vampire because at least he's semi-human. Well, actually, so is the werewolf, but by turns. That's a hard choice. But I'd go with the elves and the fairies and all that stuff. Whoa. I'd be off with, off with the fairies, as I say. Elrond and Tinkerbell are not monsters. No, they're not, but they have cousins. <laughs> they have bad cousins? They have bad cousins. Elrond and Tinkerbell are fine. But their cousins, look at the orcs were broken elves. For That's sake. true. Although we're, we're, this is in folklore. But I mean, you don't know. call orcs elves. I mean, are we, we orcs are now. orcs your favorite we monsters? Now. We call them uh, we call them disenfranchised elves. <laughs> disenfranchised. Yeah, de's. Disenfranchised <laughs> oh, elves. Oh man.
But you, you don't like orcs. You like bad elves. No. And again, you wouldn't see any in Lord of the Rings because that's not folklore. It's literature. Right? There's a difference. But, um, and I'm not particularly fond of the uh, Ikerby and Suckleby, although they would, uh, they would count. But, um, no, the, the elves and fairies and all those people were seen as being very divided in their attitudes toward mankind, precisely because of our relationship to God. Some of them, it, uh, as with the, the ones that uh, St. Anthony uh, and St. Jerome, uh, St. Jerome wrote about St. Anthony encountering, uh, some of them wanted very much to somehow share in our connection with God, to get on our gravy train, as it were. But others, it uh, made them very angry at us indeed, and put them actually in league with hell against us. There's the story of Tam Lin, which is all bound up with Halloween. Um, you know the story? Tam Lin? No. Well, it's a Scott story. It goes okay. back to the Middle Ages. Basically, there's this... Uh, Noble woman's daughter, we'll call her Lady Janet, and her, uh, her father is given her a section of land in Edinburgh called Carterhaw. But there's a story about Carterhaw. You mustn't go there, young ladies, alone, because young Tamlin, the elven knight, is there. And if you go to Carterhaw, he will have his way with you. Yeah. Well, uh, Janet doesn't care because Carter Hall is her own. Her father owns it and he gave it to her. Okay. So she goes all alone and up comes young Tam Lin. And he says, how dare you go to, how dare you come to Carter Hall without leaving me? And uh, she says, well, because it's my own. My father gave it me. Well, he doesn't have his way with her. They fall in love, which comes to the same thing. And having fallen in love, he tells her the terrible truth. Uh, he's actually human and was stolen by the elves when a boy. The queen of fairy took her to shine to him. But now he's got a problem because every uh, seven Halloweens, every seventh year on Halloween, they give a tithe to hell. And he's so rich and full of flesh, I fear it will be myself. So he says, if you want to uh, save me, then you've got to be at uh, Dylan's Cross. And when you see the fairy folk ride by, and you see a knight in full armor on a horse, on a white horse, that's me. Pull me down and hold on to me. They'll turn me into different things, but don't you let go of me. And if you can manage to hold on to me, then you'll, you'll keep me and you'll break the spell. So, she goes behind, hides behind the cross, the wayside cross, you see, in the deep woods, and there the fairy folk do ride. And suddenly she sees the one on the armor, in armor on the uh, white steed. She jumps out, pulls him down to the earth, and the queen of fairy shrieks at the top of her lungs, young Tamlin is a wah. Well, he changes into a lion. She holds him. Changes into a fish, she holds him. Changes into this, that, and the other. Holds him, holds him, holds him, holds him. And finally, he's back to his own self. And so she wins Tamlin back from the elves. And it ends, the song ends, the a ballad, with uh, the Queen of Fairies saying, Had I but known, Tamlin, had I but known, I'd have taken out your heart of flesh, and given you a heart of stone. Mm. So that's the story of Tamlin. And it takes place on Halloween when the fairy folk do ride. Okay. I don't know if I 100% buy elves and fairies being quote unquote monsters. Well, these, these seem pretty are, are nasty. They, don't they're you ugly? Think? They're ugly creatures sometimes? They can, they, be. Can, they can be ugly? They can be ugly. What were you saying before the show? The red hat elves? Oh, the red caps. The, the red caps. Well, these guys are pretty ugly, but they're, they live in the Scottish borderland. And the way they keep their, uh, their uh, hats, their caps, such a beautiful color, is to waylay people and dip them in their blood. It's pretty dark. Yeah. You've got you've to bear in mind that Walt Disney was not around to take care of all this stuff in <laughs> centuries gone by. So, 
if you think the fairy folk are simply Elrond and uh, Tinkerbell, no. <sighs> okay. Now, mind you, to be fair, some of them do resemble Elrond and Tinkerbell. <laughs> oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's not like... Oh. Uh, it's... it's uh, they're a very mixed bag. Yeah. And then some of them are animals. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not... They're not... You know how, like, with our order of creation... We have people and we have animals. Yeah. They're not the same. But they share a lot in common. I mean, dogs are physical. We're physical, etc., etc. Okay. But with the fairy folk, apart from the fact they have dogs and cattle and all that, mm -hmm. there are strange and peculiar beasts that um, wander about. But they're, they're beasts. They're not intelligent. So um, they tell the story in the north of England of the headly cow that um, would appear as all sorts of things that didn't work. A butter churn, for instance, where you couldn't get the butter going. And then you finally realize there's something wrong with it. So quick, it changes into something else that's equally useless. Until finally you figure out what it is. And in the case of the story I'm thinking of in my head, she goes, Oh, bless me, it's the headly cow. And suddenly the thing turned into what it really is, a rather stupid-looking cow. And, and uh, snorted at her and ran off. Ah, Okay. Or Black Shuck, the demon dog. Okay. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, all this for a Halloween night. And Governor Brown. Wow, he's the scariest of them all. He is. You know, he's not been able to grow hair on the top of his head since that terrible night in the swamp. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess we've pretty much come to the end of our, uh, of our time. Good to see you. Good to hear from you, uh, Cousin Barnaba. Don't take this the wrong way, but I hope they catch up with you. All right. uh, and what else? Um, well, I guess that's it. Okay, yeah, that's it for this episode. Um, if you have a question for Charles, just a after we're done here, link click the link that'll come up. And remember, if it's Monday, it's off the menu. Shout out to super fan Matthew Olson for coming up with that. Thank you so much, Matthew. And I wish you all, and I, as, as I know Vinny does, Oh, and to say nothing of our friend, happy Halloween. But an even happier all saints, a happier all souls, and a happy feast of Christ the King. God bless and take care of you.